Thank you for joining us at First Assembly of God Church in Clear Lake, California. Please welcome our associate pastor, Chris Massengill. Hallelujah. Good to be in the house of the Lord tonight, amen? Okay, so before we take our offering, we got a few announcements. I just want to remind everybody of the blue things on the back of your chair. Those are prayer requests. If you fill those out, we'll pray for those faithfully. Um, you can drop them in the tithe basket as it goes around, or there's a box in the back. You can drop that in on your way out. Um, we, uh, we have a men's conference coming up, and so this Sunday is the last day for the deadline for the early bird tickets to get our $20 t-shirt with our price for the ticket, which is $65. So if you're interested in going and got an idea you want to go, you want to sign up in the foyer, we usually go about 30 or 40 deep, looking like we're only about 15 right now. So I know there's about 15 of you that God's been talking to, and you've been wondering if you should go or not. You should. And so uh, put your name there, because we also got to get rooms. We don't want to reserve 15 rooms and not have enough people. So if you can help us out there, because it's going to roll on October 14th and 15th. So um, sign up, put your name down, and we'll contact you from there. Also, we have a men's Bible study on Friday nights. Um, even though we're about two-thirds done with the book of John, you're still more than welcome to come and jump right in. It's, it's one miracle after another going through it. It's a great study. It's kind of open. Um, so um, you're welcome to come on Friday night, 6 p.m. The women have Bible studies at 10 on Thursday in the morning and 6 p.m. on Thursday night. And I believe they just started a new book or something, so now's the time to get in there. And you have something going on on the 17th. Okay, um, mark that on the calendar. You'll get reminded a couple more times between now and then. And also, today is Pastor Steve's 54th birthday. So he's not here to play piano, so you're all going to have to acapella happy birthday. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear Steve. Happy birthday to you. And so we have uh, everybody has signed this card for you, Pastor, and then, you know, a little something, something there from the congregation. And uh, we will take this opportunity to receive our tithes and offerings. So, Lord, we just thank you for the opportunity to give back which you've so freely given to us. Today, Lord, we ask you bless and multiply these tithes and offerings for the furthering of your kingdom. Jesus' name, amen. amen. That'll drive me crazy. All right. We can go ahead and continue while they're walking down the aisles. Lord, I just thank you for the opportunity to minister your word tonight. Lord, I thank you for every person that decided to come tonight. Lord, I pray that you would bless them for their endeavors to come and see what you have to say to them tonight. We thank you for the food that we partook of earlier, and I pray that the fellowship was, was great and someone got to know somebody new. And Lord, I, I pray that anything that is said up here tonight would be glorifying to you. But mostly, Lord, I pray that your presence would just fill this place that you would touch each and every heart. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. So how many of you come expecting tonight? Oh, yeah. Ah, yeah, I love it when a church comes expecting, you know, because you come expecting God's going to show up. Amen. So it's kind of like a church unplugged here on a Wednesday night, you know what I mean? Never know what you're going to get. 
And I can tell you it's been a long time since the Lord let me preach this kind of message. And you know, um, at first it's going to bother some, but you're going to need to hang on. Don't leave till the Holy Spirit has a chance to minister to you. Just a little warning there. But I just want to let you know, God has settled in his mind to bless you. He has settled in his mind to bless you. So much so that in this word, there are over 2,000 promises in this book. And the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 1, 19 and 20, it says, For the Son of God, Jesus Christ, who is preached among you by us, by me, which would be Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, was not yes and no, but in him, everybody say, but in him Amen. was yes. For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him, amen, to the glory of God through who? Okay. God does not say no to any of these promises. Every one of these promises have been settled in heaven. They are yours as a child of God. They are secure. God's mind is set on blessing you. Jeremiah 29, 11. For I know the thoughts I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not evil, to give you a future and a hope. How's that? Is that good news to somebody today? Yeah. Is that some good news to somebody today? I, I'm, I'm talking to a whole bunch of people today who know exactly what I'm talking about. And they've experienced this. But I need you to get this in your heart. That no matter what things look like, no matter how tough things seem, how scary it sounds, God is for you. God is for you. John 15, 4 says, Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, you need, you need to get this in your heart, people. As a branch cannot bear fruit of itself, unless it abides in the vine, neither can you, unless you abide in me. You, you get what I'm laying down there. You have to stay joined to him. That's the secret to the whole thing, is stay joined to him. So now for the message. We are bound for the promised land. God has a destiny and a destination for us. We are bound for the promised land. God has already settled that in his mind. Numbers 23, 19 says, God is not a man that he should lie, nor a son of man that he should repent. If that confuses you, that's because you don't understand that repent has a couple different meanings. One means to turn the other way. This repent means to change his mind. Is God one that would change his mind? Has he said and will he not do? Or has he spoken and will he not make it good? We are heading for the promised land, church. The church in general is heading for the promised land. Just remember, life's going to throw us some tough stuff. And you might feel that you can't deal with it, but you're not prepared for it. But remember, God is for us. 1 John 4.4 4 says, you are, God, little children. you are of God, little children, and have overcome them because he who is in you is greater than he who is in the world. I'm going to tell you today, point number two. God has brought you out that he might bring you in. God has brought you out that he might bring you in. If God has brought you out of something, then God has a destination to bring you into something. God brought you out with the intention to bring you into something. It was his intention. When God delivered the children of, Egypt, the children of Israel out of Egypt... That's one I'll let you think for a minute. Egypt is a representation of the world system, which we now live in. It's a representation of that. And I want you to realize that when, when, when the children of Israel were in captivity for 400 years, they really didn't know they were in bondage. They didn't know that they were slaves. They would get up every day, 
And they would go take their straw and their mortar and they'd make their bricks and they'd stack them up and they would build and they would get their little whatever they got from the Pharaoh. Then they'd go home and spend everything they had to feed their families. And then they'd get up the next day and they'd go over and they'd build some more bricks. And they did this year after year. They had no idea by the second or third generation that they were slaves. That's just the way life was. Are you, are you seeing what I'm saying here today? When you get to the point that you can't make enough money to buy food, you're in Egypt. There's nothing new under the sun. They didn't know that they were in bondage. They just knew life stunk. And so when God came in to deliver them, he didn't deliver them just out of the hand of Pharaoh. But to get them to the promised land. You see, prior to that, God had promised Abraham, and he is not a man that he should lie, that his children, his descendants, would enter into the promised land. He said they're going to go through 400 years in a foreign land as slaves. He, he, this was going to happen because of disbelief and all, you know, they just they couldn't get it right. But he said there's a land filled with milk and honey that God has promised. God had promised Abraham, and this is about to take place. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, For I know the thoughts that I think towards you, says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you a future and a hope. God's intention is to bring you into something. God will bring you out, and he will not leave you in the wilderness. And that's a word for somebody tonight. You might be in transition. You're coming out of something, but you're not yet into something. And you feel like you're in transition. You can see the promised land over there, but you're not quite there. And you got all this going on in transition. I want to remind you of something here. Before I go to the next point. The Bible says that when God delivered the, Israel, the children of Israel out of Egypt, that when they departed Egypt, they had all the gold, all the silver, all the cattle they need for sacrifices, and not one was feeble among them. When they left, there was not one feeble among them. There was not one in a wheelchair, not one with a crutch, not one with a cane. Imagine the moment they ate that Passover meal, bam, everybody got strength. Everybody got delivered. Everybody got ready for this travel they're going to make. We're heading for the promised land. That would be a good promise for some of you because you're thinking, I don't know if I can make it. Not one feeble. But how many of you know that you can have all the gold and all the silver, but there's no grocery store? <laughs> there's some of you laughing because you know what I'm talking about. You can have all the gold and all the silver you want, but if you ain't got a grocery store to get some groceries at, you're kind of burnt. You got to remember, they're getting ready to go on a journey. They got all the gold, they got all the silver, they got all, everything they need, but they ain't got no food. But I'm here to tell you, you're the only roadblock between you and your destiny. If God brought you out, he's going to bring you in. He's already settled that in his mind. He has settled in his mind about the promise over your life. And these promises are for you to step into. He's already got a plan and a destination and a destiny for your life. He pulled you out with the intention of bringing you in. God has already spoken and God is going to provide for you. That means if you don't make it into your promised land, at the end of the day, the only person's fault is yours. Everything is there. You just got to go take it. No one can stop what's happening except for you. Just like we began in the, in the beginning of this thing, we're talking about that God was taking this church into the promised land and, and there was nothing going to stop what God's going to do. And the first thing he told us, if we don't unify, we're going to shut the door. We went through those ser sermons, remember that? Disunity shuts doors. I want, I'll let you know this, that 
After 40 days, the children of Israel rolled up right to the edge of the Jordan. And then they made a left. Because their disbelief and their disunity and their, you know, their bickering and their murmuring and their grumping and their coming against each other and talking bad about Moses, they made a left. And for the next 40 years, they walked in circles trying to figure it out. I don't know about you, but I don't got 40 years. Do you? I'm ready to cross the Jordan. How about you? Are you about ready to cross the Jordan? Took them 40 years to figure it out. So listen to me. If you've been brought out of a lot of struggles, God must have some kind of real big promise that he wants to bring you into. God never wastes a hurt. If you've been, been brought out of a lot of hell, there must be a lot of heaven waiting there on you to come into. Am I talking to anybody today? Because God doesn't bring you out to leave you. He brings you out that he might bring you in. Which implies something. He is the author and finisher of our faith. Hebrews 12, 1, 2 says, Therefore, for this reason, we also, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, I think we just talked about that on Sunday, um, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run the, in, with endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and as he sat down on the right hand of the throne of God. He is the author and finisher of our faith. If he brought you out, he's going to bring you in. He has a destiny and a destination for your life. Let's take a second. Let's, let's just kind of ponder when the Lord brought the children of Israel out of Egypt. First thing that happens is not one was feeble. They had all the gold, all the silver with them. First thing they get out and they're going along and they're bickering and murmuring. They run up against the Red Sea. Pharaoh and his army is coming to take them and, and destroy them. They wonder what to do. So God breathes, splits the sea, dries the ground so they can walk across without even getting their shoes muddy. And the moment they get to the other side, he just holds his breath for a second. Pfft. Takes out Pharaoh and his army. So then they get to the Jordan, make their left. Start their journey of 40 years of insanity in the wilderness. I'm not going to say it, okay? There, there's the Jordan right there. Okay, we're going to cross it. And God had to provide for his people while they were in transition from the world system, Egypt, to the promised land which he had destined them for. So he needed to provide for them while they were in transition. So he provided them this stuff called manna. Now what is manna? A lot of people will say it's like bread. It's, you know, something like that. But um, the word manna means, what is it? The Bible doesn't tell us what it is. It says it's manna. And manna is, what is it? So check it out. You walk out of your tent that morning. You look out and the ground's covered. And you're like, what is it? <laughs> and knowing God and wanting to fill our heart's desire, it's whatever you want it to be. You want it to taste like a T-bone? You got T-bone for breakfast. You looking for some, some Lincoln? Tastes like Lincoln. Maybe I want some scrambled eggs and bacon, some men's breakfast. You, you, you think to yourself, how could they eat the same thing for 40 years? But what if every time you picked it up, you're like, what is it? Pear. That would be kind of exciting, wouldn't you? You got to, what, what do we get today, Lord? It looks the same. It feels the same, but they taste different every day. Then you get tired, because how many of you get tired of the same texture? Uh-huh, you get tired of the same. So all of a sudden, they go back to their complaining and murmuring and bickering amongst one another. And they ask for quail. They're not satisfied with the what is it manna. They want some quail. So God said, I'm going to give you some quail. God is a God of abundance. Amen. 
And so he, he gives them quail. He gives them quail so much and so long that they're spitting out feathers like, dude, we are done with the quail, dude. Stop the quail. That is a great story. So if you need to stop and think about a few things, about God providing for us while we're in the middle of our transition. It's in that 400-year period from the time of Joseph's death to the end of that 400, there was 3 million people that were born as the children of Israel. There was 3 million people that came out of Egypt. And so you would think to yourself, let's say, okay, let's say that manna is a slice of bread. So every day you got a slice of bread. I'm pretty sure God would give you more than that because, but let's just say he gave you a slice of bread. Do you realize if he gave everyone a slice of bread, it would take approximately 15 tons of bread every day? 15 tons of bread every day. You don't ever think about the numbers of how crazy this sounds of taking care of 3 million people out in the wilderness. We're worried about a little food shortage. Just saying. Um, how about quail? Anybody ever ate quail? When you eat a quail, it's like what? One bite? One bite per bird. Now let's think about this for a second. Three million people eating quail till they're full. So let's just, let's just imagine and say, okay, so we got three quail apiece. That ain't even a snack, really. But, you know, we're talking supernatural here. Three quail apiece equal nine million quail every day. Do you realize they're in a desert and there's no trees or bushes for the quail to live in? So that means that God must have either created the quail and sent them in. And we're worried about a food shortage. Or he took that cubby of quail and had them fly from some other part of the country all the way to the desert for these people, nine million at a time every day. I mean, are you just looking to see how complicated it was for God to provide while the Israelites were in the middle of transition from going from the world system to the promised land? Think about this one, though, because you're eating meat, quail, and bread. You're going to get thirsty. So did a little study. It takes between three to five gallons of water per day just to keep people alive. That's not taking a bath. That's drinking, washing things off, doing whatever you need to do, sanitize, why, to kind of keep in good health. Three, so let's take three gallons of water a day. Let's take the minimum. That's 9 million gallons of water every day in the desert from a rock that was always there no matter where you were at. You see what I'm saying, church? We look at this stuff going on around us. We read our news. We do our TikTok. And you're starting to get freaked out when God can produce 9 million gallons of water a day from a rock in the desert. You want you to think, why does that rock follow us everywhere we go? <laughs> you don't talk about that right there in the desert. This rock, this water producing rock. God has destined you for a destiny. He is destined in his mind to bring you into the promised land. So I believe as a church, not just this church, but the church in general, is standing on the edge of the Jordan. We're standing there looking across the land of milk and honey. And we need to go possess it. Wish I had my alarm clock. Is everybody, it's time to wake up. This is what Joshua did. Joshua took the Israelites. He stood on the edge of the Jordan. He went in and said, you know what? Wake up. Wake up. Get your stuff together. We're going over the Jordan. Wake up. Get your stuff together. We're going over the Jordan. We're going into the promised land. I know 
I know for 40 years, Moses and that generation didn't step into it, so we had to walk around in circles. But let me tell you today, Moses and that generation is gone. The unbelief is gone. We got our stuff packed. We're going to cross over the Jordan, and we're going to go into that promised land. Can I get an amen? amen? But here's what you need to know. Even with Joshua telling him, get up, get your stuff together. We're going over to the promised land. Even with them being able to see the lush green of everything that sits over there, there were some that were never going to go into the promised land. They will never step in to the promise because they're comfortable in transition. You're comfortable in transition. We are stuck in transition. We can, we're close enough that we can see it, we can smell it, we can almost taste it. But we have learned to live in transition and we're so comfortable we're not going to step in. There's some of us that are never going to step into it. I'm comfortable doing what I'm doing, coming to my church one Sunday a week, you know, maybe a Wednesday every once in a while. I don't know about going any further. I don't know about talking in tongues and laying on hands. I don't know about any of that stuff. I don't know if I want to get super spiritual or not. But I'm here to tell you. When God asks you to go into the promised land, it takes extreme faith. It takes faith to do what God has asked you to do. In fact, the Bible says the just will live by faith. In Habakkuk 2.4. Believers should be risky people. I said risky, not risque. <laughs> Some people. <laughs> Altar team, want to come up? Worship team. So I got a simple question just to ask the multitude of us that are here tonight. When is the last time you did something you could not do normally on your own? When is the last time you did something that you could not do normally in the natural without God? Are you comfortable in transition? For without faith, it's impossible to please him. Hebrews eleven six. 6. For he who comes to God must believe that he is, he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. You see, church, I don't know long, how long it's been that you've been saved. And how comfortable you've got living in this little church life that we have going on now. Because I know God has provided for you through transition. I doubt if there's anyone in this room that is born again that is really in too big of a struggle right now. You might got a little of this going on, but you ain't, it ain't never been like it was when you woke up wondering how you were going to get high that day. Wasn't how it was when you woke up sleeping under an awning at the shopping center. Wondering where you were going to get food that day, because some of us have been there. I don't know how long it's been that God has been providing you through transition, and you're comfortable because you know what it's like to be there, and you're happy where you're here. But I'm here to tell you, there is more for us if we just step into it. If we just cross over the Jordan into the promised land. For this church on top of this hill, if we would just finish going through this next door, the promised land is on the, net, the other side of that door. There's more than you could ever imagine. There's more anointing, more presence, more all of it. If we as a church will decide that we're going over to the promised land. You have to believe that the same God that brought you out of the world system... The same God that when you cried out in despair, heard your prayers and showed up is going to show up when we cross that Jordan to possess our promised land. 
The Bible says that they sent a team over to the promised land and some come back. And they said, yes, it's exactly like they described it. There's grapes the size of watermelons. There's apples this big over there. Trees full of fruit. Got one problem though, there's giants in the land. There's giants in the land. And we are uh, crickets, I believe the Bible says. But we are but crickets compared to them. Here's the problem. Some of you got a cricket mentality. If you, if you say you're a cricket, then you're a cricket. The greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. It is time for us to go over. We're, we're not going to take it without a fight. I never said we're just going to walk in peacefully. We're going to have a fight. We're going to have conflict. We're going to have government come against us. We're going to have other people come against us. The greater is he that is in us, and it's time for the church to be the church and go forth into the promised land and possess all that God has for us. Thank you for letting me preach.